Hi, how you doing? Good, I hope. I've been doing an awful lot of studying. And I'm, the issue that's most gathered together, <clears throat> I have a very old book here I've had for many, many years. And it's shabby. It's a <clears throat> symbolic interaction, a reader in social psychology. And I think this will help me figure out sociology and political science. In fact, <clears throat> the psychology about this, which is hooked together, it had a little uh, paragraph here that I think really describes it. Man, as a person, is an historical creation and can most readily be understood in terms of the roles which he enacts and incorporates. These roles are limited by the kind of social institutions in which he happens to be born and in which he matures into an adult. His memory, his sense of time and space, his perception, his motives, his conception of his self, his psychological functions are shaped and steered by the specific configuration of roles which he incorporates from his society. Which uh, is going to teach me a lot about it, <laughs> for sure. This big book is late, and I've got to get back to the library. I've been banned from there anyway. The Oxford Handbook of Comparative Politics, and it tells a lot. Look how thick it is. Oh my god. And I'd like to tell you how their chapters run and what they have in them. But if you read about political science, I su strongly suggest you have a dictionary close by or on the computer <clears throat> to look up some of these words. They're very complicated. <clears throat> and in chapter one, with the introduction, uh, the first couple of paragraphs. Why do authoritarian states democratize? What accounts for the contours, dynamics, and ideologies of the nation state? Under what conditions do civil wars and revolutions erupt? Why is political representation channeled through political parties in contemporary democracies? Why do some parties run on policy programs, others on patronage? Can citizens use elections and courts to hold governments accountable? These are some of the crucial questions that comparative political scientists address, and they are the questions, among others, around which this volume is organized. We asked a set of top scholars in the field of comparative politics to write critical surveys of areas of scholarship in which they are expert. We assembled the volume with two guiding principles. First, we are committed to the possibility and the desirability of generating a systemic body of theoretical knowledge about politics. The discipline advances, we believe, through the theoretical discovery and innovation. Second, we embrace a Catholic approach to comparative methodology. Don't forget that sentence. In the following paragraphs, we offer an overview of our author's contributions with occasional critical commentary of our own or additional thoughts on the directions in which the future research should go. And if you want to really find out what's going on in politics, read this book. This is the Politician's Bible. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, what I thought really interesting in here was on page 12. Number four, political instability, political conflict. Revolutions, civil wars, and social movements are central objects of study in comparative politics. Blending his training as a historian with a keen interest in comparative analysis 
Stephen Pincus examines the historical conditions that generate revolutionary episodes. He asks, why do revolutions occur and why do they have dramatically different outcomes? Scholars have argued that revolutions occur exclusively as a result of social and economic modernization. Scopo and Huntington. Huntington. More recently, in an influential line of argument brought forth by Goldstone has framed revolutions as the outbreak that follows a Malathusian imbalance between a growing population and its environment. By contrast, according to Pincus, the necessary prerequisite for revolution was always state modernization. State modernization programs simultaneously brings new social groups and new regions into direct contact with the state and legitimize ideologies of change. These two developments create a social bias and a language on which to build revolutionary movements. Revolutions lead to very different political outcomes, in part following in the steps of Barrington Moore Jr. Pincus argues that revolutions lead to open democratic regimes when the state relies on merchant communities and foreign trade. Absent the latter, however, revolutions typically result in the imposition of an authoritarian regime. Where Perlowski alerts us to the presence of endogeneity problems, Calvus alerts us to their centrality in a subject that reality is placed centrally on the agenda of comparatives, comparativists, civil wars. Calibus reviews a plethora of studies of civil wars that offer a plethora of independent variables, features of the societies before the civil war broke out, or features of combatants in their pre-war incarnations. These pre-war outbreak features of societies and combatants ostensibly explain the likelihood of civil wars occurring, their duration once they occur, or the intensity of the violence they unleash. But such extragenous explanations, Calvius explains, may be wrong-headed. Much changes as civil wars unfold, including the distribution of populations, the preferences of key actors, and the value of resources over which combatants seek control. These new war-driven conditions are themselves likely to shape the outcome of interest. Collective and individual preferences, he writes, strategies, values, and identities are continuously shaped and reshaped in the course of a war, while the war itself aggregates all kinds of cleavages from the most ideological to the most local, which was a part that showed me that the political scientists Go to sociology classes first. That backs political science. Sidney Tarot and Char Charles Tilley examine contentious politics, episodic public collective action, and social movements, sustained challenge to holders of power. They analyze the ways in which these contentious politics and social movements happened in a dynamic sequence. The authors observe that modernization and the spread of democracy spawned the inter invention of social movements, yet at the same time the time and location of social movements, that is, their interaction with political institutions, society, and cultural practices, determined the form in which they emerged. Tarot and Tilly conclude by reflecting on the impact that globalization may have had on the processes of political and social mo mo mobilization as we know them. They ask whether globalization may more or less automatically connect potential activists across the world, present them with similar challenges, and thus move social movement collective action away from the local and national concerns. Their answer is probably not. Domestic political factors and involvement of national states and international organizations are the best predictors of participation and transnational contention. And my question is, 
how long before all these movements started in our nation was this written? Hmm. Some more research. Look back in DeVry's chapter complements that of Tarot and Tilly by surveying theories of contentious politics in light of recent global protest movements. To fully understand the phenomenon of contentious politics, they remind us that we need to operate at three levels. <clears throat> at the macro level, researchers have developed a vast array of explanations that span from precise economic structural theories such as the impact of trade on the welfare of populations, to cultural hypotheses, for example, the impact of modernization on the perception of elites in underdeveloped countries, to the emergence of a global civil society or global institutions that permit generalized protest and act as focal points. These macro-level stories must be complemented with meso-level causes, in particular the insights of strategic political opportunity theory that makes protest feasible. Finally, understanding contentious politics involves comprehending the micro-level components of action, the motives that bring individuals to the fore, their resources, their prior commitments, and the network networks of that rear them in political action. And I wondered, <clears throat> I never quite knew what this was for, and when I heard about it, I always wondered uh, how people work for this and who did they work for and what kind of stuff was they doing? Well, I'd bet a nickel that this is one of the high price things a political candidate, especially the Republicans, pay for political scientists, scientists to come and work for them so they know how to manipulate and trick people into voting for them. Uh, this is just my idea. We'll see more later. And this is on page 350, 3.2, Respectifying Civic Culture. Working often independently of one another, a rich mix of political scientists, <clears throat> game theorists, historians, sociologists, and other social scientists has generated considerable literature going beyond the standard meaning of civic culture. Three advances are especially important for our purpose. One strand deals with trust. Originally, trust was considered a critical dimension of the syndrome of positive attitudes or political orientations that went into the making of civic culture. Allman and Burba, 1963. Unfortunately, the comparative literature of the 1970s did not seriously engage in further explorations of trust. Credit must go to Diego Gambetta, 1988, for placing trust on the research agenda again across the entire range of social, economic, and political life. Since then, interest in trust has mushroomed. Oh, indeed. We can't find any. One problem brought to light by Tilly, <clears throat> 2000, oh, that's a big page, I guess, is that much of this literature has generally neglected, <clears throat> excuse me, to draw attention to the fact that people have created and recreated trust networks as endogenous me mechanisms for sustaining networks for markets interpersonal credit, and other forms of economic and social organization. The interactive process required to integrate these trust networks in public national politics was, however, rarely available, often unstable, and generally hostile. Support for this new view can be called up from research in different parts of the world. A few illustrations should suffice. Going beyond the formal institutions of government, some analysts have uncovered dense trust networks in the form of local and civil civic organizations in the history of Latin American democracy. Format 2003. These networks have been characterized as a form of civic Catholicism. Catholicism. Gee, I didn't say it right the first time. Imagine that. 
to distinguish them in a provocative way from political models developed for the North Atlantic world and too hastily universalized. Civic Catholicism was stronger in Mexico than in Peru, but its basic outlines were similar in both nations to the point of treating it as con constitutive of democratic life in Spanish America in the same way that Protestant Protestantism and Republicanism were constitutive of modern democracy in Britain, the Dutch Republics, and the United States. The critical problem in Latin America, explored more in depth in other studies, is that trust, trust could not extend to macro-political orders grounded as they were in constitutions of tyranny. What happened in Quebec with a somewhat similar kind of civic Catholicism helps to understand what kind of macro-political order complements democratic trust networks. Research has discovered that Catholic action youth movements of the 1930s and other such organizations played a central role in formulating the religious ideology underlying the quiet revolution in the 1960s. This is why recent research has placed in sharp relief the Catholic origins of the transformation of the Quebec vision of society and state. The relative success of Quebec's own brand of civic Catholicism came to depend on the constitution of Canadian federalism. Trust networks developed in the Sicilian countryside with the rise of Christian democracy in the 1890s suggest some important and not just temporal differences from the civic Catholicism found in the New World. The steadily increasing improvements that followed in Sicily with the spread of Christian democracy in the late 1890s drew attention to the as yet unremitied problem of absent of law and order in the countryside. The lesson in working together that had been learned through church-sponsored associations was extended by some villagers to overcome the problem of public security in the countryside. This is how the Mafia in Villabal had often described as the capital of the Mafia emerged in the late 1890s. This development lends support to Gambetti's view that private protection has been a distinguishing feature of the Sicilian Mafia but not necessarily to his treatment of the Mafia as the price of public mistrust. The emergence of the Villabao Mafia by the late 1890s had more to do with the spirit of community problem solving that had been learned by working together in voluntary associations than with the price of mistrust of formal public institutions as such. A chief conclusion that we can take for comparative analysis is that mistrust networks like the Mafia are not constant. They are variable and do not endure forever, even among the same population. See also Sambetti, 2006. <clears throat> and there's a lot more in here about it. And you can see who is controlling the politics in your community. Those who tell you who to vote for they ain't a church no more. They're a political agency or a mafia. And we got a lot of mafia actions going on here in Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Uh, we got in another interesting part of it in here for me. <clears throat> the neoliberal institutional trilemma, NIT, or the impossible trinity of an integrated global economy, strong MEIs, independent states, strong developmental coalitions that can make and implement national economic policies, and active civil societies, conventional democratic politics that allows protectionist groups to influence the state. 
The problem is that the white states want international institutions to promote economic efficiency. Mass publics demand that their governments safeguard them, and neither international institutions nor the governments which have ceded sovereignty and agreed to economic integration managed by international institution can be held accountable as easily. And I'll bring you up some more points in this and finish off in my next one. I gotta take a swift break. <laughs>